All right, welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is the Romans Education Part 2, and this is Session 22. Uh, let's first of all, let's just read the last two verses that are available in Romans chapter 12. We'll be covering verse 15 today, and we'll cover 16 next week. But let's go ahead and take a look at both of them together, because there is a connection between them. And so I at least want us to read the two verses together although I'm not going to get the commentary out for both of them in one day. So here it is. Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. So let me take you to your note taker right off the bat. And let's fill in what verse 15 is talking about. And that is our attitude toward others' circumstances. So in verses 3 through 10, it was our attitude toward the local assembly, especially the generating of those two core features of godly love, of selflessness and loving kindness. In verse 11, our attitude toward business. In verse 12, our attitude toward tribulations. In 13, our attitude toward our giving. In 14, our attitude toward our enemies. And now in verse 15, our attitude toward others' circumstances. A lot of people, because of the short, pithy nature of what's sitting here when you read this verse, rejoice with them that rejoice, weep with them that weep. Uh, be of the same mind one toward another, mind not high things. And all of the verses that came before, a lot of people look at that and see a similar type way in the Beatitudes that Jesus gave in the Sermon on the Mount. And so they call these Paul's Beatitudes. I mean, if you want to do that, you can. That really doesn't, uh, I mean, th th that's fine. I don't mean to say you can't, you know, kind of see it that way. But that really doesn't, uh, that knowledge doesn't make you any more edified. So we're not going to spend time on that. So when we talk about the circumstances that we see others, you notice that here there is nothing to indicate in the verse. There is nothing to indicate that this is just for our fellow saints in this local assembly. That this is actually now everyone that we're going to come in contact whether they are lost or whether they're saved that there may be part of our local assembly they may just be part of the body of christ that that are somewhere else and have no connection to us as we carry on these sessions um but <clears throat> in in verse 15 you're going to have this in your mind in fact lupi and i were talking about this on the way in when you value and esteem when you value and esteem a fellow member of this assembly, you are able to do so in a number of ways that um, he, he took it back to where, you know what, when, when we were yet sinners, Christ died for us because God loved us back then. But then you find out in Romans that once, once you have been justified, God loves you much more. Some people have a problem with that. And they say, how in the world can God love you more now that you're saved? than he did before you were saved and that's because there are ways that he can love you now that you are saved that he could not love you before now he can love you as part of the family whereas before remember what what were we we were anybody remember our in adam status before we were justified yeah we were enemies and so he loved us as enemies so when we covered this part about our attitude, these verses that deal with our attitude toward our enemies, we are looking at them in a very particular way and dealing with them in a particular way because that's their status toward us. We don't want it to be, but if it is, then there's a way that we respond to them. But we can't respond to them in ways that they do not, uh, that they don't have that relationship, right? And so... When you got saved, there were a lot of relationship 
uh, aspects that your heavenly father could now love you for that he could not before no wonder he said much more now being just you know and so um, and, and so that his love does that our love ought to do the same thing uh, okay uh, <clears throat> in Romans 9 to 16 just so that everybody understands that is the section that we call godly wisdom and um, everything that's in here when this is normally preached this is like a checklist for the ideal Christian and so everybody in fact they they kind of they kind of take this thing here in Romans chapter 12 in these verses up to verse 16 and they say this is the kind of the mountaintop it's the apex it's the ideal and if you're uh, if you're a Christian then this ought to be what is what what it is like for you the part that fails in that is two things number one Romans 12 is not the apex of your Christian life it is important it is foundational and it is essential but it's not the apex this is not going to get you to the top of your Christian life you know what this is this is the foundation upon which everything else is going to get built so I don't look at it as the mountaintop I look at it as the base camp and then and the second thing about that is uh, seeing it as um, uh, the, uh, the all the things that we need to do to be the ideal Christian this gets preached as though it's a motivational sermon that you just need to try harder to do these things the different the subtle difference is None of this is meant to be done in the energy of our flesh. This is all meant to be done by this word working in us and transforming us so that the life of Christ gets does those things in us and through us. I know that sounds, I don't mean it for it to sound mystical. We've talked about it so many times. I think everybody understands the process by which that happens. But let me just put it up here because I want to remind everybody we're just about out of this section we've got verse 15 and verse 16 and then we're out of this and I just need to say it one more time you're you're going to, you're going to be confronted I don't know of another way to say it I don't need, mean confronted in a bad way but you're going to be made aware uh, of the doctrine and you may be made aware of it because you hear someone preach it you may be reading your Bible and now you've just read it you may be looking in some kind of book and they make a reference to it but in some way you you are made aware that's probably a better way because everybody thinks about confrontation as argumentative but you're confronted by the doctrine in some way the second critical thing is that you understand the doctrine in other words you can't just know that, that, that it's there you have to actually understand what it is saying to you the third step to that to identify um, what's, I, I had this word in my head when I started to write this up here it's not in your notes so you won't, you won't be able to help me by looking there uh, to, to identify oh, this is not the word I had but I'll just say it this way to identify the result in other words to be aware of what the doctrine is designed to do in us what is the purpose of uh, there it is identify the purpose of the doctrine in other words you have to kind of know what it is that this doctrine is trying to do that first note taker that we did today you know what that is that is a summation I mean you can just still look at it on the PowerPoint in in, in verse 15 here, here you, if you understand what the verse is saying you also understand that there is a purpose behind this doctrine and in verse 15 it is to develop in us a specific attitude toward the circumstances of the other people that are in our lives and all the different life relationships uh, 
you know, and, 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 and that's what that is. That's why I gave that to you. Because if you don't understand what the doctrine is going to do, you don't know how to apply it. So you have to be aware of that. Then the next thing you have to do is you have to... <clears throat> you have to participate with the doctrine. I know for many of you this is old hat. But I need to remind... You know what, if you're not already doing this, it's easy for this to fall out of your thinking. And I know, I know but I just, because I talk to you and communicate with you and, and I, or I see you, I know that many of you, you do this. And, and what are the different ways that we participate with the doctrine? That's a very general way of talking about it. Give me some specifics in how we can participate with the doctrine. And I chose that word. I did choose that word on purpose because I wanted you to help me fill in the blank. What's some, what, are, what are specific ways that you participate with the doctrine? And, 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 I, and I'm going to put a couple of bullets down here. Linda, thank you. You're going to be talking to your Heavenly Father about this doctrine working in you. So if we back up, I mean... <laughs> We haven't gotten into this verse yet, but uh, except to read it. But if we back up to the previous verse where it's talking to us about our attitude toward our enemies, then if you have someone who really does consider themselves to be your enemy, then you would be talking to your father about how you are supposed to respond to that. What is the godly response? You, know, you see what I'm saying? In prayer, talking to your father about that is a big part of that now somebody break that down what would be component parts of that prayer what would be things that you would be saying to your father about that so i'm going to sub i'm going to just break this outline what somebody on zoom jump in here what would what what constitutes your prayer if you're doing this think of a time when you've done it give me an example of that what are some of the things that you would be saying to your father? Don't worry. Don't worry about it sounding elementary. Don't, don't worry about that. No, that's not the issue here. What we're trying to do is we're trying to get everybody on board to understand exactly how this works. I would say something like, Heavenly Father, you taught me not to recompense any man evil for evil. Okay, okay. So you're okay. So this is talking about. I'm just going to say it this way, Eric, because if we were talking about a different doctrine, we'd be talking about a different. But, but you know what? You're talking to your father about what you understand out of the scripture. Okay, this is your understanding. What else might be in that prayer? <laughs> okay, so you know what? I'm going to put thankful because there are some things that you're supposed to be. There are, some, you know what, there's a, that, you're right. There's a lot of things that are not going wrong. But if you're talking about with regard to your enemy, there is, is there a way to be thankful in the midst of that? Not for an enemy, of course. God's not saying just be really glad. Go make some more enemies. That, you know. <laughs> so so okay so give me somebody give me something here somebody on zoom jump in here how what if if look if the right. bible's right i know we're not in thessalonians but in everything give thanks for this is the will of god in christ jesus concerning you first thessalonians five eighteen. if that's true and it is how in the world can you be thankful thankful for the opportunity to be conformed to the image of Christ. Go ahead, Larry. Okay, thanks, Cindy. Same thing. Thank you for, for the opportunity and the privilege to put Christ on display, the life of Christ in us on display. That's wonderful. Amen. Did everybody get that? You say, what are you going to write out here, all that? I'm going to write this. Romans 8, 28. What does Romans 8, 28 say? All things work together for good to those that are the called. To those who love God and are called according to his purpose. That's right. 
Because all things work together for good. And in what way do they work together for good? That it's all going to turn out rainbows and unicorns. No, the good is what Larry and Cindy were just talking about. That is the work in your inner man. That's the eternal work. That's the real work. That's the valuable work. That's the work worth, that, that's the result worth having, right? And so, yes, thankful. So thank you for that, Richard. You got something else? That's exactly right. So he's bringing us right, he didn't have his microphone on, but he's saying that's why, that's coming right out of understanding the doctrine. When you understand the doctrine and you know what it's designed to do, then you know what? Now you can, you, you, you can begin to function out of it. There's another way to say it, and that is to apply the doctrine to your everyday life right and so part of this prayer is father I, you know what whatever the script part of this prayer is this is my understanding of what this is that's an important part of that prayer do you know why because when you hear yourself talking to your heavenly father about a scripture and you realize you know what not everybody maybe is this way but i think a lot of people are like me I need, when I have an idea about Scripture, I need to say it to somebody besides myself. Because when I say it out loud to someone else, then if there's some part of it I don't really understand, but I hadn't identified that because it's just all going around in my head, I will come to that place as I'm explaining it and go, oh, see, it'll be... Uh, you know, I will carry the logic will have a broken link in it and, I, and, and so I realize that the second thing is I think about it better when I'm saying it to someone so Billy was really valuable for that because I could talk to her about this doctrine and then say and now question me about it and so I'm and so that's that's our understanding you're doing that and if you do this when you're talking to your Heavenly Father and you're really thinking about it in a wrong way, it will become evident in your prayer life. The next thing that, that you can do is you can look. We, we did a whole sheet on this in 19A, B, and C. Remember when we filled that out? I know you do. And we talked about listing all of the inner man benefits of the tribulations. So that you do what? So that you don't do this, but you do this. Fill in the blank. We don't focus on the external. We, yeah, we, that's right. We don't focus on the external. We don't look at those things which are seen, but we look at the, look things, at the things that are not seen. What are those things? Those are the spiritual inner man issues. Somebody want to give me something else about this prayer? You got it. This is the, this is the important part. If if you get to here, you're 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 you you are you're most of the way home, but if you miss this last step, it's it's almost like hitting the home run and failing to touch home plate. Don't miss when I'm, the bag. Yep. When. Uh, when I'm tempted to respond negatively towards someone else because of whatever external circumstances there are, I can use that doctrine to respond appropriately, no matter how bad of a circumstance I'm in, treat them with love, put a loving on them, instead of acting irritable and throwing a sarcastic remark. Okay, thank you, Gene. That's Gene Harris up in North Texas. It's part of the Glen Rose Assembly. It's Rod. So, just so you guys know, I don't think you've heard Gene before. Anyway. This is Rod. Rod! I'm sorry, yeah. you sound just like Gene. <laughs> Rod, I am really sorry. No I worries. misidentified your voice. <laughs> I thought I knew, and I didn't. I am so embarrassed about that. 
please? <laughs> I wouldn't worry about yeah. it. It's all I right. I called Eugene Harris. He'll be mad now for a week. You know. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank Rod. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, Rod Salt. And um, uh, anyway, okay. So Rod, thank you for saying that. So I'm gonna change. I'm gonna take all of that big long thing that Rod said because he he said in a sentence exactly what we've got to do. Now you've got to talk to your Lord, to, to your Father about how you will apply the doctrine because if you don't come out with that at the end of this I'm talking to you about my understanding of this and as you're saying it to him you still you're getting the sense yes you know what I'm understanding this right I'm looking at this verse and I'm looking at the benefit of my inner man why are you doing this because this this is the thing that's motivating you to do this because if I can apply this doctrine and live out of this doctrine it's going to transform me in my inner man it's going to conform me to the image of God's son and isn't that what we're in it for now you tell me how else will that that take place what does the Bible give you another way uh, you know what this is called Paul summed this up the effectual working of God's Word tell me how else that is going to take place it is not there is no pro there is no other way oh I got an idea how about we read the Bible through in a year Look I, look, I know people do that. It's not a bad thing to do. You're reading the Bible. But that it will, is, will not, that will not transform you. If all you're doing is every morning is looking at a devotional application of your Bible. You know what I'm doing here is I'm kind of pulling the curtain back on what I do. Not that what I do is what you should do. But for me, I, I used to do that every day, you know, have quiet time every day. Try to, uh, you know, spend time in the Word and get some kind of devotional thing out of it. But that did not, that, you know, the only thing that did is it gave me something to try to do in the energy of my flesh. It did not produce the life of Christ in me. That only comes when you go through this process on purpose. So to participate with the doctrine involves prayer about your understanding of it, about what you know that it's going to do in your inner man, and then you're going to talk to your father about how to apply that doctrine. So really, I've kind of given you the answer, but there's a second step here. It's not just prayer, but now it's, yeah, now it's action. So let's, so you know what, you know what all of this is really you know what all of this is really helping to entrench you know this answer I'm just hoping that you'll make this connection all Godly of this, thinking yes thank you who said that it's Rod again Rod okay all right I did I, I was talking and when you came over I didn't I didn't hear you good okay yeah this is godly thinking that's entrenching the godly thinking in you so this what was the word you said, Linda? Oh, action, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to put your word up here. But out to the side, you know what this is? This is the godly living. Right? Yeah. So, so as we're prote so I know, I know I stepped aside from it. Is this helpful to see this? I'm hoping that everybody that's on Zoom is looking at this. And look, you, we cannot. I have never been happier with the progress that is being made spiritually by not only what's going on here, but what's been going on with the folks that aren't here physically. In fact, I have been pleasantly surprised 
at how well they are doing without actually being in this room. Just really pleased with that. Um, I don't mean it in the bad connotation of it, but, you know, just almost proud of the fact of how they have taken this doctrine and done the work with it. And, and I don't mean that in a bad sense, in a prideful sense, but, I mean, I, you know what? I, I, maybe I should say I am rejoicing over the fact of what they are accomplishing. But listen, we can't, we can't coast and we can't just sit on those laurels and think that that is enough. We really have to be engaged in this. And here's what I want to say, and I can say it to this group, and I don't think people get their nose bent out of shape because you've been with me long enough. If you're still with me after this point, then this is going to be an easy pill to swallow. But here's the thing. We can't get lazy on this. You cannot stop doing this process. If you're in that Zoom group or somewhere, if you're, if you're listening to this later on and you never have been doing this, I'm begging you to start. This is the only way the Bible talks to you about how this doctrine gets rooted in you so that Christ is formed in you. It's not about us doing the best we can. And so if you haven't done it, start doing it. If you've done it a little, do it more. And if you're already doing it, keep doing it. Because this is the only way we're really... We, I can take you through the education, but I can't make you edify. And we, here's the thing. When we get to the heavenly places, the Lord is not grading us on the curve. He is not looking at us and saying, well, you know what? He's not, he's not looking at it that way. We will occupy a position that is commensurate with where we really are. And, and that really are is not, I'm a preacher, so I must be attained to some level of God. That's not it. You can be a preacher and not be at all. All you have to do is get enough information and not be afraid to speak, and then you can just do it. And, but, but you know what? If you don't understand this process, then what's happening, I'm telling you, what's happening is your flesh. And the flesh loves this stuff because it makes it feel so good. But we have to get to this. This is it. This is it. So keep, keep doing that. It's, um, it's important that we continue. All right, so I am glad that we took that aside. So now let's move on through here. Uh, because as we look at this verse, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that we be of the same mind one toward another. That's the first part of verse 16. Let's just talk about this first part, weeping with those that weep and rejoicing with those that rejoice. The per, the, I, I'm going to take the second uh, one first uh, because that is the easier one to do. There is a natural empathy that is built into us that causes us to weep with those that weep. I mean, to really to uh, kind of feel their situation or feel their distress or, or, or some kind of thing like that. But look, you know what we are? We're a body. And because we're a body, there are supposed to be connections between us that are being ever strengthening so that we truly do now begin to think about the things that are happening so that there begins to be this godly response of weeping with those that weep. And our Father, and by the way, and that, that being knit together, that's, that's part of that process that all of this is going to be producing. So when you, th now in the beginning, in the beginning, you'll have to do this on purpose. You'll have to look at this and you'll have to say, someone is going through this situation and I really want to feel that empathy for them. Now, in order to illustrate this, and I do want to do this, by the way, 
There is something that is happening in the world today, and I just want to take a minute and talk about it. Um, there, I think there are pendulum swings when it comes to this thing of weeping with those that weep and rejoicing with those that, re, uh, you, you know, that are rejoicing. Uh, and I think the world has seen all of that. In the past, there have been all kinds of philosophies of life. One of those is Stoicism. Let me just put it up here. Stoic, the Stoics were people who just denied emotion, totally denied emotion. Now, you understand the pendulum swing to that is to live your life out of your emotions. You should never live your life out of your emotions. It's not the time for it. I'll, I'll, I'll chase too many rabbits here, and then we will, we'll be out of time. You should be living out of your spirit, and that is what transforms you in your spirit. That's what you should be living out of, not your emotions, because your emotions are really quick, and they're the last thing to get on board. When we get into this new book, I'm actually going to talk about that process a little more, but we'll leave it for when we get over there. But the Stoics were a people who uh, practiced not showing any emotion. In fact, they denied having emotion one way or the other, not just in the realm of sadness, but extreme people. And now, look, I know there are people that by their nature, they're a little more even keeled. Okay? They do get excited about things, but, you know, maybe they're not as quite as extrovertish as other people. But, in, in, you know, inwardly, they're very excited about that, and they may show that a little bit. Then there are other people who do this, you know, and they, and they feel that. Personality types, and again, I don't want to get into all of that. If you're, you know, if you're phlegmatic, then I understand you're a little more even keeled. If you're sanguine, like I am, you're a little more prone to the roller coaster. Uh but stoicism is making a comeback today. So if you were a stoic and you had kidney stones, you would deny that you were in pain. Well, I've had kidney stones, and I have to tell you, that is a very exquisite kind of pain. If childbirth is worse than that, every mother deserves a medal. Because I have to tell you, that, that was about the worst thing I have ever, it, it was the worst thing I ever encountered. That really put me on my knees. I toughed that out for about 10 hours. And you know what? And then I went to the hospital. The only thing they did really is give me something for pain. But you can't, you can't, well, you can fix that process, but it's invasive. And so it's better to let all that. Okay, never mind. Why am I getting into that? So these are people that they, they deny that they have pain. If their family is falling apart, they deny being broken hearted over that if they suffer the loss of a loved one they're very straight faced about it and you, you know and they would deny that there was any sadness so any kind of emotion uh and and so and people sometimes equate that with um and i understand keeping your emotions under control but denying the reality of that not not biblical not godly do not equate stoicism with godliness. And I don't think anybody that's listening to this would. But that was an accepted lifestyle of Paul's day. So what I'm trying to do is take you back into history a little bit and just remind you that in Paul's day, the Stoics had a big presence. So when Paul writes, rejoice with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep, he knows he's going against the grain of a large part of the society that he's living in. Let me tell you what preachers do. They, do one, they swing a pendulum in one of two ways. They either know somebody in their congregation is doing something that they don't like or, or think is right. And you know what they do? They create sermons for just that person and then they preach those sermons. They, they, they may think that they're trying to help them, but, um, but what they're doing is they're tailoring it for people just like that. And usually, everybody knows what's going on. I don't know if you've ever been in a church like that. I've, been, I've sat through a few of those sermons 
uh, in the past not a lot of them but from time to time the other pendulum swing is this is when you come to something in the word and you know it's not going to sit well with some people that you just kind of leave that out because you don't want to rock the boat you understand the danger of both of those pendulums what you have to do is preach the word and just let it be what it is it's what it is and i know what guys say look i don't want to get fired i get that but are you a hireling or are you really a pastor to these folks are you willing to tell the truth when people don't want to tell the truth i i'm not fixing to tell you and and a, a truth you don't want to hear don't don't start digging your foxhole and putting your helmet on you don't need to do that i'm I'm, I'm not going to do that. But when we get into the next book, I am. <laughs> Just telling you now. But it'll be one that you, when you see it, your flesh will go, gosh, I don't like that at all. But you know what your spirit will say? You know what? I actually rejoice in that. And you'll see. Anyway, we'll talk about that when we get over there. So, what I want, so Paul is preaching the very opposite of Stoicism. What I want to do is I want to show this to you to explain a passage. Um, every summer, I would say to the kids when they were growing up, we're going to memorize Scripture this summer, and I will pay you a dollar for every verse you memorize. And we put a chart on the wall, and we put their names up there, and then every verse that they memorize, I wrote that in, so they could not repeat that verse in three weeks and get another dollar and so i said and you can do any verse you want to do I, I understand there's a really short one we're going to read it today everybody in here probably knows what that is and uh and and <laughs> look i don't want to get off in that story but someone said to me you're bribing your kids to memorize scripture no i'm rewarding them for memorizing scripture I, I would just wanted to try to stick with them. Anyway, off of that. So, I want to take you back over into the book of John. It's during the days of the Messiah. It's Israel's program. But when I was in Bible college, I'm back to the story now. When I was in Bible college, we looked at this event and we talked about, anybody know that shortest verse in your New Testament? What is it, Sarita? Yep, Jesus wept. Every one of my kids had that one right up front, man. That, I memorized that one. Okay. S but you know what? We used to debate this. As preacher boys, we would sit in there and we would go, why? Why did Jesus weep? And so everybody kind of had an idea. So then you know what we did? We went and asked some of the teachers of the Bible classes, and we'd say, we're talking about this thing in the dorm the other day, and you know Jesus wept why in the world why was Jesus weeping why was he weeping and you know what we found out all of those guys had a different idea so now we got all kinds of ideas so you know what I want to add one more to the mix the only difference is mine's right okay so <laughs> I do you know what I wouldn't say if I really didn't think it was right I wouldn't tell it to you but I'm just trying to be gracious about it and having a hard time evidently um, so here's uh, Jesus. There's a couple things that we want to talk about here. Um, remember where we are. Re weep with those that weep. That's the part of the verse that we're talking about here. And what I want to show you is that in both programs, whether you're a member of the believing remnant of Israel or you're a member of the body of Christ in the dispensation of grace, should you expect suffering? So as a result, would you think there would be events that would bring sorrow to your heart? Absolutely. Do you think, I mean, I understand clearly from Paul's epistles that there is doctrine that is meant to work in our soul to keep that sorrow from being overmuch. In other words, overwhelming us. Don't you believe that there would be doctrine for them as well? there is there is now paul paul doesn't say the exact same thing to us that gets said to them 
but they would expect that. And so I'm going to introduce us to one of those uh, events. Um, Jesus is especially close to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Now these are brother, this is brother and sisters in the same family. He is really close to these people. And now let's read through because I want us to kind of set the stage here. Now, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. The fact that there is a verse in the Bible that actually points that out. I mean, you would say he loves everybody, right? Now, I think this verse is in there to denote that there really is a special relationship that he has with them. Jesus hears he's not where they are. He hears that Lazarus is sick. And he's in Jerusalem. They're in Bethany. Let me show you. Uh, if I, I, well, let, first, let me read this next verse. Now I'm going to show you a map. And so here it is in verse 6. When he had heard, therefore, that he, talking about Lazarus, was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. Now, if you read the whole chapter, you'll, figure, you'll, you'll realize Jesus is in Jerusalem. Where is Lazarus? He's in Bethany. So let me give you a map. I, I don't know how clear that came out. Can y'all see that at all? Uh, it may be a little small, but I don't have a way to point here and get it there. But down, you see the Sea of Galilee up top? You see the larger Dead Sea down below? Just written across I'm going to step out of the camera folks on zoom just give me a second so I can point to them Bethany is what is written right across the top of the Dead Sea it's right here and Jerusalem is right there the Bible is actually going to tell us how far apart they are and so we're going to read that but the part but but in a, but we'll read it in just a moment Lazarus is in is in Bethany. Jesus is in Jerusalem. I'm going to tell you now, that's about two miles. When Jesus finally decides, remember he heard, and what did he do? He stayed two more days. And so, uh, so and so he knows. By the way, when Jesus finally decides to go to Bethany, he knows that Lazarus is dead. And he tells his disciples, let me show you the verse, verse 14. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. So word came that he was sick, and Jesus stayed, and then Jesus knows that Lazarus has died. And now I want to take up the account in verse 17. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs long. How long is a furlong? 660 feet, 220 yards, an eighth of a mile, eighth of a mile. So... If a furlong, and it is, if a furlong is an eighth of a mile, and here it is said to us that it's 15 furlongs, it's just over two miles. Two and an eighth is what it is. So we know how far away that was. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. So she actually left the house and went out and met Jesus on the way. All right. Then said Martha unto Jesus. Now she's met him. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee. So let's just keep reading. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet 
shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town. Remember, Martha had gone out and intercepted him. Uh, not yet come to the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep there. What are they probably going to do? Probably going to follow her, aren't they? I mean, that's what they figure that she's doing. Verse 32. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. She, he's already heard that once, hasn't he? In fact, don't you reckon that they probably had that conversation, Mary and Martha? If Jesus was here, our brother wouldn't die. Verse 33, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, See, that's what they did. They followed her. He groaned in the spirit and was troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Here's verse 35. Jesus wept. Verse 36. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. I heard, you know, someone say, Jesus wept because he loved Lazarus. That's what the Jews were thinking here. I heard a preacher say one time in my Bible college classes that he was not weeping because he loved Lazarus. He was weeping over the unbelief among these people. Now I heard another guy say something else. It's not important for me to run through those. But as I'm studying in Romans 12, it occurs to me that you know what Jesus is doing? He's doing exactly what Romans 12 is asking us to do. Let me ask you, do you think that the attachment that Jesus has with these people is godly? Do you think then he is capable of identifying with them in their grief? And that's exactly what I think. Now, I have a couple of passages other to show you. That's exactly what I think is going on. Because I don't think he's weeping over the fact that Lazarus is dead. Do you know why? Because when he left Jerusalem, he knew he was going to raise him from the dead. I'll show you that in just a moment. If he knew that from the beginning, if that was us... If that was me, you know what I would be prone to say? Hey, stop crying. This is going to be a great day. You're going to get your brother back. In fact, he's going to be sitting at the table in your house eating the supper that you fixed, and you're going to be with him tonight. Don't cry. But he doesn't say that. He doesn't. But even though he knows what he's going to do. And he doesn't chide them for crying. As a matter of fact, he weeps. And so, knowing full well what he is about to do, verse 35 takes place. Because you know what? I believe the connection that Jesus has with these members of his little flock is of such a nature that there is this natural connection with them that allows him to enter into the times of their grief and also the times of their joy. Now, I don't know to what degree 
and in my mind I get this picture of them with the wailing and, and all of that maybe that may or may not be right but with Jesus I see him fulfilling the same principle in Israel's program that Paul is talking to us about in uh, Romans uh, chapter 12 and verse 15 I want to give you a quote from a Presbyterian theologian from back in the uh, 1800s Charles Hodge I like Charles Hodge. I don't agree with everything he's ever written, of course, but I like Charles, Ho Charles Hodge. And I, I do have some things that were written by him. And when I was thumbing through that, I found this. Char oh, oh, I'm sorry. I was supposed to read John 1. Did I miss that? I was supposed to read. No, we did 32, didn't we? She fell down his feet. Behold, he loved him. John 11. Oh, I'm sorry. I was supposed to read verse 11. These things said he, and after that he saith unto him, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Now, this is back when he was at Jerusalem. I'm sorry, I was supposed to set this up. This is back when he was at Jerusalem. This is back in verse 11. So he's talking to the people that are with him there. He says, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. What are they thinking? He's resting. What is Jesus talking about? He's talking about his, his body has died. Okay. Howbeit Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus said unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Remember, we read that verse. So now I backed you up to show you what was going on just before that. Now, so did Jesus know when he left Bethany that he was going to raise him? Well, he just said, I go that I may awake him out of sleep. They go, well, if he's sleeping, just let him sleep. He goes, no, he's dead. So if he's going to awake him out of sleep, what is he going to do? He's going to raise him from the dead, right. And so he knows in Bethany. That's the point that I wanted to make. So why is Jesus weeping? Let me take you to verse 33. When Jesus, therefore, saw her weeping. I didn't highlight it, but, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her. This is Mary. When he saw them weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And what is that next verse? Jesus wept. What was he doing? He was weeping with those who weep. I really think that's what he is doing. Is he weeping over the fact that Lazarus is dead? He's fixing to raise him. Is he, is he, and by the way, he did say that to Martha. You remember back when he said, well, I don't remember exactly how he said it. Let me just run back. Mary, when she said, okay. And he said, um, verse 23, Jesus said to her, Thy brother shall rise again. He says that, and she goes, Oh, I know at the last day. Now he's going to just show them. So you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't debate all this with them. Oh, you, you people. No. He enters into that grief with them, and he weeps with them because that's the nature of the connection that they have between him and the members of his little flock. And so now I want to give you that Charles Hodge quote where he wrote this how lovingly genuine sympathy is how much like Christ is the person who feels the sorrows and joys of others as though they were his own Charles Hodge gets it he gets it if we're members of a body and we are interconnected and we really are going to function as a body this is the relationship that needs to be produced in us and I'm going to tell you the only way that's going to get done is by being confronted with the doctrine sitting in Romans chapter 12 and verse 15 and understanding what that doctrine is talking about and that's why we've gone through all this so I might give you an understanding of that kind of a connection and we identify the purpose of that doctrine and it is to bring cut because by the way Jesus didn't raise everybody that ever died in that little flock they will be in the resurrection, but they weren't then. By the way, Lazarus died again later. 
So you understand what the purpose of that doctrine is? And now the, the way we have that. We're not in the days of the Messiah. We're not looking at him in a physical body fulfilling all of those things that the prophets talked about. So what we do is we get our godly thinking entrenched by talking to our Heavenly Father about Romans 12, 15 and being thankful for that because we realize not only what can be produced in our inner man, but also what can be produced, yeah, in the body's inner man because they will benefit by that and then determine how we will apply that doctrine. And that's why I said to you in the beginning, this is not the natural way to do it. You're going to have to cultivate that in yourself by on purpose practicing the doctrine. Because today, what we do is, you know what, some people, and we really are sorry and ge genuine sorry, but it, it's, it's more than that because the world feels that. It's the ability now to be able to, to, to enter into that I'm looking for a word I'm not say, I don't want to say feeling because that's not what I'm trying to get at here it's about being able to be con I, I want to say connected but that's not really what I'm after either I just it's, I want to get a more encompassing word for all of that it it, 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 it look uh, uh, yeah, a, 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 a sympathetic, empathetic response to what another member of our body is going through so that it does have that kind of effect on us genuinely. And the real test of that, if it's genuine or not, and I'm sorry I'm not spending as much time on this part as I probably want to, but you've got notes, so I look, look at those. But the greater test of that is when someone is rejoicing. Because when good things happen to them... You know what the immediate response of the flesh is? That should be happening to me. How come I don't get that? And so you know what people do? They kind of smile and go, oh, good. But too many times what's going on inside is, well, how come you get that? Now, you may not think of it in that way. I sure hope we don't. But you know what? That doesn't mean that we're there yet where this body really has that kind of uh, interconnectedness and love for each other to such a depth that we really do begin to have that, that godly empathy for what is going on in our fellow believers. So if Richard comes in next week and goes, I won the lottery, we're millionaires. Yeah, we're all your friends at that point, Richard. But, yeah, yeah. So, but, but you understand, if so, that happens to somebody, people go, oh, that's good. But, to be, but you know what it's like to be genuinely happy for someone. But now you know what we're talking about? We're talking about having this now as a way of life with each other. And that, that is going to require these verses now, this process that we're going to go, that's the, that's the only way that gets generated in us. That's the only way you'll ever see that progress getting made. And that's the way we'll have to do it. So, I, that's, so I, there's more to say about that, but I think you get it. Uh, there's notes that are there. So I do want to take you, oh, that's next week. So, and we've done all the note takers. So we'll stop right here.